All right. Let me get started right away, because we don't have much time in these presentations here, so I want to make sure I can knock out everything I want to cover. So real quick introduction, because that's not what's important. My name is Steve Sims. I am uh, the curriculum lead at Sands Institute for offensive-related courses. And I am the author of a bunch of courses on exploit development. The better part of my career has been focused on bug hunting, finding zero days, doing end day vulnerability research, meaning get the patch from Microsoft or whichever vendor, and then dipping it against the unpatched version and locating the vulnerability. Because the faster you can weaponize that vulnerability, the more valuable it is, because most organizations don't quickly patch. And we've seen that time and time again. Really interesting, about a month ago or so, Chompy, if you've heard of her, brilliant researcher online, and then also Ruben, who she works with at, I believe, IBM, they did exactly that. They took a kernel, Windows kernel zero day, or not zero day, but vulnerability. The patch came out on Patch Tuesday. They had a working exploit the next day. That is fantastic and amazing to see on Windows 11 in this day and age where so many exploit mitigations are there to stop us from doing this beautiful craft that we want to be able to do. I found my love in vulnerability research because it's the one thing that I realized I will never be the best, nor do I want to be. I will never run out of stuff to do, and it will always be extremely challenging, and that's what I need to keep me going. So it's fun, binary exploitation, being able to weaponize a vulnerability that you find against the kernel or against the browser, compared to even 10 years ago, it is night and day difference. I remember about 10 years ago, my good friend Corland Coder, Peter Van Eckhout in Belgium, we both were weaponizing browser bugs and selling them to companies like Tipping Point, ZDI for example, or um, what's another example, iDefense that was at VeriSign at the time. And you could sell, and there's, these are ethical buyers. So when you sell exploits, you've got a lot of options. And some of them are ethical, some are unethical, and it just depends on your morals and where you stand on that stuff. For me, I always wanted to make sure I was responsibly disclosing it, but I did want to get paid for my research. So these particular vendors I just mentioned, they would buy the exploit from you and they would disclose it to the affected vendor and work with them to make sure that it got patched and it didn't get out there as a zero day. So you'd make 10 to $20,000 US for these exploits, and it only took a single exploit to fully remote code execution, all the things you need. One exploit. Nowadays, to do that same thing, it's three exploits. You need a remote code execution bug, you need a information disclosure bug to get around ASLR, and you need a sandbox escape. Three to do the same thing. So they're worth much, much more money nowadays than they used to be. Even ethical buyers, like the ones I mentioned, iDefense, for example, and ZDI, they will pay you maybe 100,000 US dollars now, what used to be 10 to 20,000 dollars. If you go on the dark net-esque options, like if you go to Zerodium, for example, or some of the others, you can expect to get a half a million dollars, even up to two plus million dollars I think I have a slide on that here. So let me just start jumping into this stuff. I really just wanted to explain kind of why I fell in love with this topic area and why it'll never run out of stuff to do. So what is vulnerability discovery? I pretty much explained a lot of that already and you already know the answer to that. We want to find them first. The faster we can find something and if we find something no one else has found before that we know of and there's no patch for it, that's a zero day. It's the big prize, it's what everyone wants. It's worth a lot of money. And your campaigns can be very successful with, of course, those types of, uh, that power, those exploits. And, and again, the end day vulnerability research, like patch diffing, is almost as valuable. Most of us don't work at organizations who are gonna be a target of zero days. Zero days are expensive. If you go back to like Stuxnet a long time ago, that was four zero days chained together. I've never worked in an organization where someone's gonna spend seven figures trying to break into my computer. So most organizations are a target of, if we're talking about binary exploitation, are a target of patched vulnerabilities. And it's the fact that most of our organizations don't patch quickly. And even if we can say we are patched up to date with this month's Patch Tuesday patches, there's likely gonna be a lot of missing patches. 
I remember Microsoft released this diagram one time when they were talking about the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, an exploit card, and they showed, it looked like a checkerboard, and it was a bunch of different colored squares, and it was demonstrating that even on a supposed fully patched system, there are a lot of holes, because an administrator may have deferred patching for some specific patches because it was gonna in, like, potentially break production and they don't wanna do the screen test or lose their jobs. So even if you're patched up to date, you probably really aren't, completely anyway. So most of us are gonna be a target of that kind of stuff. Vulnerability research is a huge essential part of software security, software development. You've got to be doing that nowadays. In the code world, you've got things that you can do during when you're writing your code. I remember Microsoft came out with something called the Security Development Lifecycle back in the early 2000s when they were starting to work on Vista, which came out in 2007. Vista was the first operating system to go through the SDL process. And what that meant was mapping in security to every phase of the development lifecycle. Threat modeling, attack surface reduction, secure cryptographic design. When you're writing your code, you need to use the proper exploit mitigations. Don't use banned functions. Do static analysis, that's where I was getting to. Static analysis and manual code review as well as code scanning with code scanning tools, that's going against the source code. If you're manually inspecting code, it's time consuming. So we typically focus on trust boundary areas where there's going to be maybe going from user mode to kernel mode or going out to hardware. That's gonna be some trust boundaries. So we do static analysis against those sensitive code areas and then when we compile the code, we do dynamic analysis which is gonna be where we do fuzzing, fuzz testing. We send malformed data to what we hope is well-behaving protocol implementations or file format specifications. And we think of all the ways the developer could have messed up and we try to break it. We do fault injection and different techniques. We use different techniques. And we wanna do that first before the bad people do. Organizations, especially ones that are creating security appliances, should absolutely be wonderful at this stuff, but if you follow things like Google Project Zero and have watched folks like Tavis Ormandy and others, you've learned, of course, that password management tools, big devices that do intrusion prevention and others, I won't pick on anyone, have fallen victim to the thing I'm describing right now, not doing what I'm describing right now. So that's why we wanna do it. Example methods of prevention, I just mentioned a couple of those, like static and dynamic analysis, secure coding and all of that. Exploit mitigations is the one I really wanted to get to. That is the one that saves us at the end of the day. Microsoft came out with the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit when Windows 7 came out. It was a beautiful product that was free and you could install it and it would, at the application level, at a very granular level, allow you to apply mitigations to these critical applications like browsers and email clients and others. We're processing apps and what it does is it typically hooks functionality. So when you go to do something like call a critical function, a critical function is something that maybe has the ability to change permissions in memory as an example or allocate memory. It hooks them and says before you're allowed to call virtual alloc to allocate memory and set permissions, we're gonna run a couple checks or a few checks. We're gonna make sure that the stack register is where it's supposed to be. We're gonna make sure that the destination address where you're changing permissions isn't somewhere where you really shouldn't be doing that. The adoption rate though was less than 5%. That's terrible. So Microsoft decided we're not going to continue working on this product. And when Windows 10 and 11 came out, they retired Exploit Guard, I'm sorry, uh, Emmet, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. Exploit Guard thankfully came out and replaced it. It is not on by default. What you see over there on the right of the slide is just a GUI example of what Exploit Guard looks like. Most admins never touch it. One, because maybe they don't understand what the mitigations are doing. They don't want to do the screen test and potentially lose their job or break production. It's very technical when you get down at the level of understanding exactly what these mitigations are doing. Some of them require the developer actually understand the mitigations and code in such a way to support the mitigations. So the likelihood 
of this all happening is very low, and the adoption rate of organizations turning on these mitigations is extremely low. I've been doing a webcast series, um, a stream on YouTube called Off by One Security, and the whole reason I started it was really to help defenders and to give free kind of technical training to folks in one or two hour chunks. And a lot of my time has been spent on these mitigations. Because if you use them and you're unpatched, it is the best prevention that you could possibly have by turning them all on. But you do have to understand them. Most of them won't break anything. You're probably fine, but probably it's not a good answer or you know, we don't wanna hope for that. We wanna make sure it doesn't break things. Which is wonderful because it comes for most of these mitigations with an audit mode. Kind of like an intrusion detection versus prevention where detection will just alert you, but prevention of course would block it. If you turn it on completely, it will block and it could potentially break applications. But if you turn on audit mode, then you can make sure that it doesn't break anything. If an alert occurs, you can go and validate that, oh wow, that would have broken production traffic and there was no malicious activity going on. But in order to be able to determine that, again, you've gotta be quite technical. So that's one of the big problems, is, is making sure your administrators are at that level of understanding to feel comfortable and safe turning on these controls. So why hunt for vulnerabilities? I already talked about this one. We're not gonna spend any more than 30 seconds on this slide, but this is an example of Zerodium's bug bounty program where if you have one of these vulnerabilities like an exploit against Signal or WhatsApp or iMessage, Windows kernel, Linux kernel, Mac kernel, that's the price tags over there on the left, up to 2.5 million US dollars. Who is buying this? So Zerodium, for example, is buying those exploits from you. Who are their customers? That's one of the big questions. They have customers who are asking for a remote code execution zero day against iOS to be able to root your iPhone remotely, zero click, meaning I just send you a text message, you don't even have to look at it, and it exploits your phone and roots it. That's powerful and expensive and worth many, many millions of dollars, and there are bigger buyers than this one out there. So that's why, of course, attackers are gonna wanna hunt for those vulnerabilities. So real quickly, the focus of this talk is supposed to be on how do we get started in bug hunting? So let me keep moving along quickly. There's tools out there, not all tools are equal. One of the things you need if you're going to be doing binary exploitation and vulnerability research is a disassembler and a decompiler. If you are not a developer, if you are not comfortable reading code, real code like C, Rust, C++, then it will not be easy for you. What I've found having done this for so long and been teaching for so long is that so many people, students who come to a class to learn some of this stuff don't have a coding background. So therefore, they are much more comfortable reading assembly versus pseudocode. That's assembly on the right. There's a small, simple example. That is not easy to read, but those without a, a good amount of code experience are more comfortable reading that. The problem is the amount of code in disassembly is sometimes 10, 20 times more than the pseudocode, and you'll see an example of that soon. A disassembler takes a compiled binary, like Notepad or Calc, and it disassembles the machine code back into its mnemonic instructions, which is assembly. If we wanna go higher level, we can decompile it back into our source code or pseudocode. So disassembly is something you need to be comfortable with. You need a disassembler. Ida Pro is the most famous one out there, but there are many others, some of them free, some not. So Hexray's decompiler is an expensive decompiler. It's probably the best one out there. Ghidra, for example, does have a decompiler. There are different plugins that people have written to do decompilation, and those are not the only players in the field. But what they're trying to do is taking that compiled program and its machine code and pull it all the way back into its source code. Now it's pseudocode, so you can't just go and take it and compile it. You've gotta be able to read it. You've gotta do a lot of cleanup a lot of times as well. But look on the, on the left, see the diagram with all the blocks? That's disassembly. Those blocks are called blocks. Those are blocks within a single function within a program. All those lines are lines of disassembly that you need to be able to read. On the right, and I'm not expecting you to be able to actually read it, 
because it's small. But on the right, on the top, that little top right area, that is the decompiled code. Look how few lines that is compared to the disassembly. And that's not even a great example. What you see there in the big black area is the structure that we're looking at, the structure of something called the thread information block in user mode on Windows. So we need a decompiler so that we can view what's close to the source code. Additional tools we, we need. We don't need all these, and there are multiple options to accomplish the same goal, but IPyta. Python is a fantastic, very friendly, with huge user contribution language out there. It is, it's seen immense growth over the years. It's easy to learn in terms of coding, and there's been so many plugins and tools written in Python or written to support Python that that's why so many people use it. IPyta and PyCharm, these are a couple of tools that we can use together when we're doing bug hunting because if you've ever used IDA Pro, how many of you have used IDA before? Or any disassembler? Yeah, so I'd say a third of the hands went up. IDA is not known for being very, uh, the introspection is lacking, let's say. There's not a whole lot of help out there that is easy to read. When you look at the API, the documentation, it's not helpful at all. It's very minimal information, so any help you can get is useful, and that's why I put these specific examples up. With IPyta and PyCharm together, so PyCharm is a IDE specifically for Python, which is rare that you would find an IDE dedicated to a single language. And it loves Python, it's all Python. And what you can do by using those two together is actually write your script using lots of introspection help. So if you map things properly, when you start typing, it will auto-populate or start giving you suggestions as to what you might want to type out. That is immensely useful when it comes to working with tools like IDA because of the lack of documentation. We can also execute our code in the IDE, have it take effect through a client server model in IDA Pro and get the results back in our IDE. Stuff like that is very, very useful. Sark is another fantastic tool. If you've used something called IDA Python, which is basically a Python-based interface to the API for IDA Pro. So the native language that Hexrays, the company that made IDA Pro, gives you is called IDC. It's a C-type language. It's not very good. Python is much easier. People are more comfortable with it. So someone created IDA Python, and IDA Python in itself, but just by nature, is, is, is complex. So any help we can get is, of course, useful. So Sark is a basically object-oriented scripting layer written on top of IDA Python. It simplifies things. It understands what we typically want to do in, in IDA Pro, and it allows us to instantiate an instance of an object and call all these methods or functions of typical things that we as a researcher want to do. So in short, if I was to summarize, it's something that helps us take a tool that's very complex by nature and simplify it and give us much easier access to the functionality that we typically want to be able to do and use. Frida is another fantastic tool that we can actually use to, let's say we, like, I'll give you an example. That's kind of what it's doing there on the right in that code sample. Um, let's say we want to understand what the protocol or the file parsing mechanism is in a application. In other words, let's take Microsoft Office Suite. If I open up Office Word specifically and I want to open up a document, there's a lot of runtime code that starts up at the beginning and then I click on file and then open and navigate the file system, click on the file, open the file. Believe it or not, there's a ton of code that executed to get us to that point. Code that we don't care about at all. Because if I'm doing bug hunting, I care about what's parsing through the metadata of that file, because that's where we're gonna find our vulnerabilities. So I wanna know what that code is, especially when we don't have something called debugging symbols. Debugging symbols are extremely helpful to developers and anyone wanting to read or disassemble or decompile the code, because it gives us information such as the function names internally in the program that are typically going to be stripped they're stripped because the developers don't want you to reverse their products. So anything that they can do to make it more complex, they often will. Thankfully, Microsoft gives us symbol files pretty significantly, which is, is wonderful. Most organizations don't do that. So with, with this, 
I want to understand without having any information about the program or any function names or any symbols, I want to know exactly what code is parsing through the metadata of the, the file. Tools like Frida allow us to, to do that to basically set up and hook. We can hook a function, such as a function that's going to open the file. And by hooking it, we can then display only the code and do things like get a backtrace as to how we got to that point. Kind of like if you walk outside of your house and there's a, a coffee shop that's a half a mile away and you wanna walk to it, you've got many ways that you can go to get there. You're gonna take the, the best way, the fastest route. But there's many other paths you can take. I wanna stalk the application behavior and understand how did we get from here to the actual protocol parsing or file parsing code. That's what I want to know. Tools like Frida and others will help us do that. Binary diffing real quickly is when we take, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, we've got Patch Tuesday. Microsoft has a very well-documented and defined process where on the second Tuesday of each month, we get patches. So I knowing this, I take the patches every Patch Tuesday there's something called uh, WinBindex that someone created that basically has all the, s the patch files that come out. And we can take the, the patch that comes out, let's say it's a patch to the Windows kernel, NTOS kernel EXE. I can take that patched kernel file and diff it, run a differential against the unpatched version. It will expose to me any of the functions that have code changes in them. There might be 50,000 functions in that object and only two are showing code changes. You've heard the term maybe needle in a haystack. How else would I know where the code changes are if I don't diff? It's extremely useful. We can expose only the functions that have code changes, and oftentimes it's a single function or just a couple functions. And then we can go in and look at the code and compare it to the old code, find what the changed code is, where it is, and understand the vulnerability and potentially weaponize it. Easier said than done, but that's what we're using binary diffing for. So finding vulnerabilities, time is flying. So tips, one of the big things is um, how, how do we get started? If I wanna, if maybe I know how to do something like uh, browser, I shouldn't say that, maybe web app bug hunting, like cross-site scripting and SQL injection, c -surf, that type of stuff, and you wanna move over into binary exploitation, that is, uh, it's a big leap. Awesome for going and doing that, but it's a lot harder than web exploitation. So when you move over there, like where would you maybe start? I would say memcopy is a good place to start. It is a function that is almost always involved in a vulnerability at some point. It's not memcopy's fault. Memcopy's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It has something called a size argument, and that size argument allows you to specify how many bytes are permitted to be copied to a destination buffer. But that size argument has to be correct. If someone is able to trick memcopy into copying more data than was allocated, you have a buffer overflow on the heap, typically. So memcopy is a good place to start because the way in which the buffer or the size argument is calculated is often dynamically constructed. And if you can get in there and figure out a way to change that size argument, you can cause heap corruption. So by identifying applications that use memcopy and then setting a breakpoint on it in a debugger or looking at the cross-references to see who calls memcopy, you can oftentimes expose potential vulnerabilities. And even if there's not a vulnerability, your understanding of how things work becomes much greater. Another example of where I would start including memcopy is one of the examples I'm gonna show you real quickly here is um, a, a bug called DNS SIG RED. It came out a couple years ago. It was a, a big vulnerability, it was a big deal because it's DNS, that's a publicly exposed service that organizations have. And it, this vulnerability can result in remote code execution. That's scary. It was a critical vulnerability. It was memcopy, memcopy was there. It wasn't memcopy's fault, but the way in which the size argument was constructed was the problem. So going and recreating vulnerabilities that have already been published and understanding how and why the problem occurred that helps you go find zero days. The more you understand about big bugs out there, the better you will be at finding O days. So challenges, exploit mitigations. If you are a exploit developer or a researcher or a good, good person, bad person, whatever, when it comes to exploitation, 
um, you need to understand mitigations because you will be up against them. They are there whether you like it or not. The golden age and era of uh, binary exploitation was in the 90s and early 2000s. That was the fun time. There were no mitigations. It was easier back then. Nowadays, you've got dozens of mitigations trying to stop you. I gave you an example earlier where I said we can hook a critical function and inspect things to make sure that everything is in order, that it doesn't look like someone's attacking us. So you've got to be able to deal with them. What we're looking at here is an example of something called uh, stack pivot protection. The stack, every function call gets a small allocation of memory on the stack. It's called a stack frame. Every function call gets one. So the stack is an area in memory. Every thread gets its own stack. Every thread in an application, in a process. So there's something called a stack pointer. That stack pointer is a designated register that should always point to the top of the current stack frame. That's its job, point to the top of the stack. It should never be in any other region of memory. It should not point to any address outside of the stack. That sounds like a simple opportunity for a mitigation. There are three powerful instructions associated with the stack pointer called push, pop, and ret. Powerful, powerful instructions that only operate on the stack pointer. We as attackers, we want that power. We need that power of push, pop, and ret. So if we can pivot or steal the stack pointer away, like there, we pivoted it with an exchange instruction, we can utilize that power. So a mitigation can say, before a critical operation is permitted to occur, validate that the stack pointer points to the memory addressing where it belongs. If it points outside of that region, someone has pivoted the stack pointer, kill the process. That is um, a, a tough one to get around, but you can. You can get around it. So quick demonstrations. How much time do I have? 20, oh, I just have 20 minutes, that's awesome. I thought I was like, only with a couple minutes left. I can relax, so slow down talking. All right, now we are going to talk about some demonstrations. If you know me, if you've heard me speak before, I do speak fast, but I also try to speak clearly because I got a lot to say, and if I was to speak slow, we wouldn't be able to get through this stuff. So I'm already talking too much, let's move on. Some demonstrations, dealing with exploit mitigation. So if this works, we will be good. Yeah, we come back up. So what I'm gonna do is show you on this guy. I was planning on that guy, but I've got the same VMs over here, always have redundancy. It's restoring state right now, and what I wanna show you first, if I can get it going, is the example of stack pivot protection. Just talk about it a little bit. Maybe we can get it to trigger, I'm not sure, we'll see. Just to show you what one of these mitigations look like, because that's the kind of stuff you're gonna be up against, and the more you understand it, the more comfortable you are with it, the more effective you will be as being able to bypass this stuff. So that's the goal. And then another example I want to show you is I could possibly show an example of a browser exploit. Now this will be a browser exploit that's a couple years old. I'm one of the authors of Gray Hat Hacking on McGraw-Hill, and one of the examples I put in on the fifth edition is a browser exploitation that was both an information disclosure bug to bypass address space layout randomization, as well as a remote code execution bug. So it was a use after free bug, and a type confusion bug. Those two bugs together allowed you to exploit, it was IE11. IE11, oddly enough, was a 64-bit process as the parent process, and then it, the browser actual windows are 32-bit, which is insane. I don't know why they would do it that way. That is a beautiful desktop. We'll expand this. Right here, we've got, this is DNS, because um, one of the things I want to show you is SIGRED. I want to open up Exploit guard. Let's see here. So I'm going to bring up Windows debugger. So WinDBG. And I'm going to bring up Windows Media Player. So this is WinDebug. It's not a very uh, intuitive debugger if you've used debuggers before, but it's a fantastic and powerful debugger. And what I've loaded right now is, is WinDebug, I mean, sorry, is a Windows Media Player. And the protection we wanna look at is stack pivot protection. So let me think as to how we wanna take a look at this. Now you see at the bottom right, let me try to increase this so you can see it a bit more. On the bottom right, see where it says payload restrictions. Payload restrictions, that's exploit guard. Now, if you don't have that running, it's not gonna be loaded into the process, so most of you probably wouldn't see it there. But I've got exploit guard running. 
and I think, I have to go double check, that I've got a mitigation called stack pivot protection running, which would break things if we try to do something like pivot the stack pointer. So now that we've got this up, do I have some history in here? Let's see. I do have some history. Great. So I don't have to type everything out. Some of these commands are very long. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here on something called mit lib rop check stack pivot. That's mitigation library check stack pivot. It's the stack pivot protection function. So if we run this, it says breakpoint redefined. Let's see if it's there. It is there. And I'm going to say um, go. I'm going to tell the debugger to go. And right here, we hit the breakpoint already. So right there, you can see we breakpoint zero hit, and it says move into the quad word pointer at the stack pointer plus eight. We are moving something which is inside the RBX register to that location. Okay, not very exciting. I'm going to say let's unassemble, look at a few lines of disassembly at this point. Right down here, this is what's important. It says move into the accumulator register, RAX, R-A-X, it's a 64-bit processor register, GS offset 30. GS is a segment register. It is a 16-bit segment register. The GS segment register on a Windows process in user mode always points to the thread information block. You can count on that. As a bug hunter, you need to know that. It's important. Shellcode loves that too. Because with shellcode, one of the things we always need to do is get access to kernel 32. Kernel 32 is a library that has very powerful functions in it like get proc address and load library. We can load libraries and do anything we want. So what we care about here is it's dereferencing an offset in the TIB, which is the full 64-bit linear address of the structure itself. Right after that, it's going to be a couple more instructions after that. Let's actually jump down a few steps. Right here, this is the important one. It's saying compare what's in RBX to that structure, which is the TIB offset 1-0. What that ends up being, and you can look at the structure on MSDN, is the stack boundaries. There, every thread gets a stack, and there's a high address and a low address, which is the stack boundaries, as it's a segment in memory. The stack pointer must be pointing within that range. So notice how it's saying compare what's in RBX. What's in RBX right now would be the actual stack pointer address. And it's saying, are you pointing within the confines of that segment in memory? And below it, it says jump if below. It's not exciting. I'm not saying it is. But it's important because that is how exploit guard is validating whether or not the stack pointer is pointing where it's supposed to in memory by doing these little checks. So as an attacker, this is the kind of stuff you need to understand to get around it. You, if you're running an exploit right now and this check is occurring, it would break your exploit because oftentimes we do what's called pivoting. So what we need to do is pivot the stack pointer back into an area of memory where we'll pass this check. Again, not terribly thrilling, but important. This is the kind of stuff you're up against. This is the low-level type of stuff that you have to do as an exploit developer to be able to bypass this stuff. So if we were to go and modify, for example, if we look in what's in RBX, so that's the value in there right now. If I change it, so RBX, and we look at RBX now, oh. Is that going to be it? There we go. And I say continue. So it's going to basically break the process because I, I changed the, the address of the register to be out of bounds of where it's supposed to be pointing, so it would break the whole thing. Let me go ahead and bring this guy up. How much time do I have left? What do I have? What do I have? Ten minutes. Sweet. So what I want to do is bring up something more interesting. And the first thing we'll do while we're waiting for that system to come up is go back over here. This is the DNS SIG red vulnerability. And this was that big one because it's an exposed service, right? It's a semi-public service exposed, and if someone was able to compromise your DNS boxes, you've got big, big problems now. So what we want to do is go through an example of why I brought up and picked on Memcopy. Memcopy was the one I talked about. 
Now let's, let's take a pause for a second and say, let's put ourselves into the mind of an exploit developer and we are gonna pretend that this vulnerability does not exist yet and, and we wanna find it. So if you were somebody and you decided this weekend that you wanna go find a zero day, a major zero day, here's how you would do it. You'd say, first, pick something. Pick a service or something that would be crit a critical finding. What's an example of public services? Mail, DNS, web, that would be critical if you found something that affected those servers. Or maybe remote code execution against a browser or an email client. So pick your target first. Then, as an example I gave you, is pick a function, memcopy. We're gonna start with memcopy. Okay, we've decided that we wanna exploit DNS. So we bring up dns.exe, which is what I've got up on the screen. And we are going to go and look for memcopy first. So we go over to the imports segment, this is the import address table. It has all the dynamic dependencies that this program or library has on other libraries. So we have dependencies on things. We don't statically compile stuff. So if you wanna run my code on your system, my code has dependencies on functions like malloc and memcopy and printf. So I need to be able to resolve that stuff. Those dependencies are listed in the imports table. That's what we're looking at right now. So I'm gonna use Zoom here so we can see a little better. And we're just gonna search for memcopy. You can see these are the libraries that the dependencies are on, and you can see we're scanning through it. There's all kinds of functions within those libraries. I'm just gonna go under name and type memcpy. And there's memcopy. So this module, this program, dns.exe on Windows Server has a dependency on memcopy. So okay, I, I hit enter. Now we're going into the imports table itself, and we're cross-referencing. What we're looking at now are all the cross-references, and there are dozens of them, hundreds maybe. These are all the times in the code when memcopy is called. Again, we're, we're hunting for bugs. Okay, so now we see that memcopy is, is, is used. How do we go and find a potential vulnerable situation? Well, what's something that we might have control over in relation to DNS? So give me an example. With DNS, if I wanted to mess with the DNS server, what do we as a user or attacker have control over? Domain, domain names, right? We can, there's different types of DNS queries. So we can start sending different malformed DNS queries to see how memcopy handles it. That's where your brain wants to go. So you're gonna look at the cross-references and specifically see these names here like nsec flat read, tlsa flat read. We wanna find something with like read or write in it because those are just good keywords here. So we see all these different calls to memcopy, great. So I'm gonna sort it alphabetically. And right here you see sig wire read, sig wire write, sig flat read, sig file write. The vulnerability ends up being in that guy, sig wire read. Now, I just told you that, we didn't actually go and find that, but that's how you would go about taking this on. You would look at those names of the functions that sound interesting, read and write, as an example, can we mess around with the DNS queries to change the size argument in memcopy. That's what we wanna do. So you look up, you would use Google like everyone else or ChatGPT and you would say, what is a DNS SIG record? Off the top of your head, you probably don't know. You look it up, oh, it's part of the old DNS sec specification thing. You would learn as much as you need to know about the SIG, DNS SIG query type or record type. And then we would go and jump to that location. So right now, we are at the actual call in the SIGWire read function to memcopy. That's the actual call to memcopy. See right above it, it says destination buffer and source. The destination buffer would be the address where we're copying data to, and then there's gonna be a size argument up there as well. So I put a little comment, it says untouched size, that's a comment I put in there, but register eight, R8, that's going to be the register that passes the size argument to memcopy. That's what we want to modify. If we can get that to be the wrong size, we could do heap corruption by copying too much data to the destination buffer. Ah, destination buffer, that's another thing we want to know and need to know to be able to exploit this if there's a vulnerability. We need to know who is doing the allocation. The allocation where we're copying with memcopy to, right? So memcopy is copying data to a destination well, how did that destination come to be? That's what we wanna know. So we scroll up a little bit here. Thank you. And you can see right above it, there's a call to a function called rrallocateEx. Well, that's pretty descriptive, right? So if we double click on this guy, we are now inside that function. 
and you can see there's a call to a function called mem alloc. So right above, and this is pretty common, this is no magic here, right above the mem copy call is the allocation. Makes sense. So there's gonna be a destination address that's gonna be returned from this allocation function and given to memcopy so it knows where to copy the data. Again, we are gonna send the DNS query, a special one called a sig wire read query, whatever, and it needs to then allocate memory to hold that record, and then we need a function called memcopy to copy the data into that allocation. That's all we're doing. What ends up happening here, this vulnerability, ends up being due to the fact that right up here, see this move ZX, move ZX? That's move with zero extend. And you see it's referencing something called CX to the right. CX is a 16-bit register, a two-byte register. But memcopy takes a 32-bit unsigned argument. 32 bits, four bytes, versus right here you see an allocation happening with only two bytes. So the allocation maximum can only be 65,535. That's the max allocation size. But memcopy takes in a size argument that's four bytes, not two bytes. See where we're going? So there's an integer overflow problem here. If we can modify the DNS query so that we can force the little maths that's happening here, the little calculation that's happening there, if we can make it so we exceed two to the 16th power, that's an integer overflow, we're gonna roll over. Think of an odometer on a car, and it's at 99999. Add one to that, it goes to zero, it flips back to zero. But the one actually gets carried to the left, right? That's what's gonna happen here. So if we were to go and get this math to work out in such a way to where we overflow two to the 16th power, the allocation that happens is going to be very small when in fact the query is very large, greater than two to the 16th power. Memcopy then, when we go back to the caller here, the memcopy call then happily copies the full amount of data. So you have an integer overflow resulting in a heap overflow that allows for remote code execution because you can overwrite something called a V pointer of an object. We're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. So that's cool, I mean, that, that, that is actually, an example of how they absolutely went about doing that exploit. And that's, that's kind of the takeaway. Like, if you wanna go and start doing this stuff, you would do exactly that. Start with memcopy, there are other functions too, but that's a good one to start with because there are countless zero days out there just waiting to be discovered that are worth a lot of money. Now, we don't really have time anymore, of course, to go into more and more demonstrations, but just an example, um, of a, of a memory leak bug. This is Internet Explorer 11, and a lot of times when you find memory leak bugs, you would have a uh, information disclosure issue where see those A's up there in that weird square that shows up, and we refresh it, and now there's some strange characters that show up. That's stuff leaking out that's not supposed to be leaked out. There ends up being a use after free vulnerability that is causing this. And the reason I wanted to show this at all is because it uses stack pivoting. The exploit uses that thing that we talked about earlier, the stack pivot protection, to, to, to actually um, get this exploit working. So if we run the exploit right now, it should bring up a calculator. Let's see. So, come on, come on, come on. You're not gonna do it? Oh, Emmet detected stack pivot mitigation. So right there, I know it's small, but at the bottom it says Emmet detects stack pivot. Emmet is the old exploit guard and it detected, it caught this attack. Remember I showed you how the um, registers were being checked in something called the threat information block? We looked at that offset and said, is the stack within that address bounds? This is catching it because we utilize that stack pivoting technique, and we as an attacker would have to be able to get around this by pivoting the stack pointer back. So I just wanted to show you a quick example of that. I'm out of time here, but if we go and bring up Emmet here, which again is the old exploit guard, and we go under apps, and then Internet Explorer. Stack pivot protection is on. I'm gonna turn it off, which on all of your systems, I guarantee you it's off. And if we were to run that exploit again, the same exact one, 
you would see probably the calculator should pop up. So that's going to show up. Again, not terribly thrilling because it's a calculator, but still fun. That's the kind of stuff you would have to work on getting around. So I am out of time. Sorry for the crazy running around and stuff like that, but I appreciate it. I know you have a lot of talks to choose from, so thank you so much. Thank you.